write to me with more information, then I'll certainly have a, a, a full look at the detail of the issue she raises. Many thanks. And we now move to the next item of business, which is questions to the First Minister. Uh, question one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagements she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, later today, I will have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Uh, but earlier this morning, Presiding Officer, I spoke to the Consul General of France and conveyed to him Scotland's condolences to and solidarity with the people of his country. I've also instructed that flags on Scottish Government buildings will fly at half-mast for the remainder of today as a mark of respect. The links between Scotland and France are long-standing and strong. Indeed, we have a French-born member of our own parliament. Today, as we see further uh, tragic developments take place, we stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of France, united in our condemnation of yesterday's atrocity, deeply saddened by the tragic loss of life, and absolutely steadfast in our defence of the fundamental freedoms that we all cherish so much. Yeah. Many thanks. Kezia <laughs> Dugdale. Presiding officer, in a democracy, we must never give in to attempts to censor the media or curtail the freedom of speech. May I join the First Minister in sending the condolences and sympathies of these benches to the people of France and indeed the French community here in Scotland. This week, the newspapers in England have been full of reports about a crisis in the NHS as a &E departments come under severe pressure. How would the First Minister describe the situation in a &E departments here in Scotland? First Minister. Um, Presiding Officer, our National Health Service uh, right now, uh, and in particular our accident and emergency departments, are facing significant pressure. That is very often the case during the winter months. Uh, during the winter months, it's not just a case of the number of attendances at A&E, but it is also about the severity of illness and the number of admissions to hospital, uh, combined with factors like norovirus that increase the pressure that our hospitals are working under. If I look in particular at Greater Glasgow and Clyde, they have had over the festive period what the chair of the board described to the health secretary this morning as an unprecedented level of very sick people being entirely appropriately admitted to hospital through accident and emergency, many of them frail elderly people with respiratory illnesses. Uh, we prepare with health boards very carefully for the winter period and many health boards have opened additional beds and expanded staff capacity. The Scottish Government made available £28 million uh, to health boards to help them prepare for winter pressures. And I want to take the opportunity, presiding officer, to thank all of the NHS staff who are working so hard right now to deal with that increased demand. At every single occasion on which a patient waits too long in accident and emergency is deeply regrettable and we will continue to work hard to improve performance, not just in the winter months, but all year round. But finally, presiding officer, I think it is important to put winter pressures in some degree of context. Nine out of ten people who attend accident and emergency departments are seen within four hours. So there is much work to do, but I think we should mark the good work that is already being done. Thank you. Thank you. The staff in our NHS do a tremendous job, and it's because I value the work that they do that I'm shining a light on the problems in our health service here today. The First Minister may say there's no crisis in our NHS, yet earlier this week her officials tried to silence NHS staff they asked health boards not to respond to press calls for details of A&E performance over Christmas. The A&E crisis in England is public because the statistics are published every week. In Scotland, we won't know how our NHS performed over the Christmas period until February. Will the First Minister commit today to publishing A&E figures every week, just like they do in England? First Minister. Well, can I... Firstly, say just in the interest of accuracy, the email that uh, Kezia Dugdale referred to was not an email to health boards. It was from an official to statisticians uh, seeking advice on the reliability of statistics. No instruction went from ISD to health boards. And I think we've seen from the wealth of information that health boards are putting into the public Absolutely. domain in recent days that what Kezia Dugdale uh, says to be the case is manifestly not the case. Can I also say, can I also say before this government came to office, 
Labour did not routinely collect accident and emergency statistics at all. They, they simply took snapshot surveys. Since this government has been in office, there has been quarterly reporting of accident and emergency statistics. From February of this year, from next month, that reporting will move to monthly. I want to see as much transparency as possible so that we are equipped and so that we can ensure that our health boards are as equipped as they need to be to deal with the pressure they face. Uh, the pressure on our uh, health service and on our accident emergency units during the winter months is uh, obvious and I have detailed some of the reasons for that. My job as First Minister, the Health Secretary's job, the job of this entire government is to make sure that we do everything to equip our health service to meet the demands that they face. That's what we have been doing and is it exactly what we will continue to do. Um, President officer, harking back to the labour years might comfort her back benches, but it won't comfort anyone who slept in a trolley last night. All across the country, presiding officer, patients are being turned away or receiving unacceptable treatment. The Victoria Infirmary in Glasgow is using a porta cabin to treat patients. Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee admitted delaying treatment because the hospital is too busy. And in Aberdeen, the Royal Infirmary has had to cancel 80 operations this week, including another 15 this morning. The list could go on and on. Does the First Minister believe there are other instances, and does she think this is acceptable standard of care? First Minister. Can I just take, take a, a few of these points? I mean, let me deal with the Victoria Infirmary first of all. I mean, the facility that she refers to, as I understand it, was first opened 10 years ago, but that's not the point I want to make about the Victoria Infirmary. Uh, the accommodation in that hospital is not as good as it should be, and it's not as good as we want it to be. But, presiding officer, that is exactly why this government is investing £850 million in the construction of a new hospital on the south side of Glasgow, which will open this year and replace the facilities at the Victoria Infirmary. That is the action this government is taking to improve the National Health Service. And secondly, you know, recording progress that has been made while acknowledging work still to be done is not harking back. It is simply recognising the reality. Today in our National Health Service, there are almost, almost three times the number of A&E consultants than there were under Labour. Not just a few more, but almost three times the number. 75 under Labour, 201 under this government. There are 1,700 more nurses working across our National Health Service. The budget today is nearly £3 billion higher than it was under Labour. And lastly, presiding officer, but perhaps most importantly in the context of the very serious issue that we are discussing today, there are in Scotland today two accident and emergency units that are operational that would have been closed if Labour had remained in office. Monklands, Monklands and Air A&E units have treated thousands of people over the festive period alone. So yes, there are pressures and this government will help health boards face up to those pressures. But let me say this, these pressures would be considerably worse if Labour had continued in office. Thank you. Again, presiding officer, we hear about Labour's record when Labour were in power. What the First Minister... What the First Minister needs to understand is that when Labour came into power in 1999, I was still at school. Eight years she's been in power and eight years worth of government decisions that she is responsible for. And from today, she has to take that responsibility. The problems at our NHS are not new. The RCN have been warning you for months about the problems in the NHS. This government has been in office running the NHS for eight years. We are just one week into 2015 and a clear pattern is emerging. The workers in the North Sea oil industry are saying jobs are at risk, yet the First Minister is posted missing. Our teachers are saying that the Scottish Government have abandoned Scotland's pupils and the First Minister has nothing to say. And nurses who keep our NHS going are crying out for support, yet the First Minister has plenty to say but no action to offer. At a time when our public services and industries need government support more than ever, people in Scotland have one simple question. 
When will the First Minister fix this mess? First Minister. Well, of course, uh, when I was, as uh, Kezia Dugdale describes me, posted missing, I was in Ninewells Hospital yesterday announcing money for additional yeah, nurses absolutely. in our National Health Service. And you know what? I, I'm not surprised that Labour don't want to be reminded of their record in Scotland on the health service. But can I say to Kezia Dugdale, if she doesn't remember Labour's record in Scotland and she wants a reminder, she can look at Wales right now, That's the only it. part of the UK where Labour is in charge of the National Health Service, Order. budgets have not been protected and performance is considerably worse. But, presiding officer, presiding officer, it's not, it's not Labour's record. Mr Henry. Look, I know there was a member of the Labour Party yesterday who said that uh, Labour's treatment of the NHS was nothing more than, I think this is an accurate quote, a crude ploy to buy votes. And I think they're displaying their cynicism here today. But it's not Labour's record I'm focusing on, presiding officer. It's the SNP's record. And for the benefit of the Labour benches, let me just repeat some of that record. Three times the number of A&E consultants, 1,700 more nurses, £3 billion more being spent on the health service and two accident and emergency units that are open and operational now that would have been closed under Labour. So I accept each and every day that we hold office we will have more work to do to make sure that our NHS cares for the patients that depend on it. But I think the people of Scotland will want to see this government moving forward. They will not want to go backwards with the Labour Party. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, may I associate these benches with the words of the First Minister regarding yesterday's atrocity in France? We all stand in solidarity with the people of France and with journalists everywhere who reveal, report, challenge and defend. Like them, we know that freedom of speech will never be silenced by gunfire. I would also like to ask the First Minister when she will next meet the Prime Minister. First uh, Minister. No current plans, Presiding Officer. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Deputy Presiding Officer, our oil industry needs our support. I welcome today the UK's government's decision to cut the supplementary charge. It was outlined in the autumn statement. It was implemented last week. I've already written to the Chancellor calling for his commitment to a new investment allowance to be brought in within months. These are measures of support upon which we can all agree and which have been welcomed by Oil & Gas UK. But given the fall in the oil price, which would have left an independent Scotland with an £18.6 billion black hole over the next three years, does the First Minister not agree that this was a bullet dodged and that the best approach for both the industry and the country is for us all to work together on a UK-wide basis? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I don't agree with that. I believe and I always will believe that the best uh, way forward for Scotland is to be in charge of our own resources so that we don't have to be subject to the kind of cuts that we're seeing coming at us from the UK government, but instead can be the master of our own destiny. Uh, can I also, though, on a more positive note, say that I very much welcome uh, Ruth Davidson's uh, perhaps slightly belated support for the measures that this government has repeatedly been asking for from the UK government. Uh, we do believe the supplementary charge should be reduced. Uh, the reduction from 32% to 30% announced in the autumn statement was welcome, but of course uh, the government in the UK that Ruth Davidson supports was the government that put the supplementary charge up from 20% to 32% in the first place. Yes, we need to see an investment allowance, but we need to uh, stop having that talked about in vague terms and have detail around exactly what the proposal is. And I also think we need to see tax credits for exploration in the North Sea, something that when Norway did, saw a significant increase in exploration in the months and years that followed. Fergus Ewing uh, will, of course, uh, make a statement to Parliament this afternoon, and he will publish alongside that statement information on the work the Scottish Government is doing around skills, around innovation, innovation, around uh, support for exports, but will also make very clear the kind of action that we now need to see from the UK Government. And if Ruth Davidson wants to back us on that, then I welcome that very much indeed. Ruth Davidson. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm disappointed by the First Minister's reluctance to endorse a UK-wide approach. Disappointed, but not exactly surprised. 
as that response does sit alongside the comments made by her immediate predecessor this morning. I don't know if she's read today's papers, but Alex Salmond apparently wants to use the general election in May to sever all our UK ties apart from foreign affairs and defence. That means that the £18.6 billion black hole, currently borne on UK-wide shoulders, would fall solely on Scotland, meaning cuts to every school, every hospital and every service that we rely upon in this land. But further to that, this full fiscal autonomy plan would tear our tax system apart and it would dismantle the stable UK-wide regulatory regime which the oil industry relies upon. It would be a double whammy for an industry that is already struggling. So does the First Minister really think that at a time when the industry is looking for stability and security, it's looking for political leadership and support, at this critical time that the SNP solution is to rip everything up. Mr. Minister. I, I'm, I'm just well. waiting for the holding of the front pages for Ruth Davidson's earth-shattering exclusive here at First Minister's Questions today, Alex Salmond backs independence. Who knew <laughs> that that was the case? You know, I, I think... It's quite admirable in some respects that Ruth Davidson, as a supporter of a government that's been one of a successive uh, UK governments that have squandered our oil resources, that has failed to invest in an oil fund, can stand up here and talk about oil and gas without the hint of a brass neck or a blushing face. But she mentions stability. I think we should look at some of the comments from those uh, in the industry about the so-called stability of the stewardship of UK governments. Malcolm uh, Webb uh, of UK Oil and Gas uh, says that he has been truly bewildered by the way in which successive governments have treated the UK offshore oil and gas sector, uh, experienced repeated and increasingly aggressive tax hit, had a, result, uh, a confused and confusing energy policy with a revolving door approach to the appointment of ministers, a total of 35 different energy and treasury ministers given responsibility in the last 14 years. That's the verdict of the industry on the UK stewardship of the oil and gas sector. So my position is I will do everything on the part of the Scottish Government to support uh, the industry. The Scottish Government Cabinet will meet in Aberdeen next month month, but the UK government has to get its act together, stop talking about supporting the industry and actually start to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Constituency question, Adam Ingram. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister to intercede on behalf of the 200 strong workforce of USC Dundonald in Ayrshire, who yesterday were made redundant without notice by their employers part of the Sports Direct group of companies? And will she join with me in condemning the actions of Sports Direct, owned of course by billionaire Mike Ashley, in its reprehensible treatment of this workforce, many of whom I understand were employed on zero hours contracts? First Minister. Well, yes, Presiding Officer, I was extremely concerned when I became aware of developments which took place yesterday at USC Clothing in Dundonald. My concern as is the concern of Adam Ingram for the shock impact this will have on the employees affected, their families and the impact there will be in the surrounding area. In terms of good practice and employee relations, I would expect there to be a consultation period with employees to provide an opportunity for all avenues to be explored. However, I'm also aware of a news report which states that there is a notice of intention to appoint receivers in the High Court next Tuesday in respect of USC stores. I can confirm that through our PACE initiative we have offered support to the company for affected employees. Also our local PACE team has this morning gone to the company's premises in Dundonald to discuss PACE support. The last update I had was that the local PACE representatives were sitting waiting in the company's reception area to see a company representative. Uh, I hope this reassures uh, the Chamber that this government will do everything we can to support all of these employees affected by events at uh, USC and also to make very clear our expectations of good practice and employee relations. Thank you very much. Question three, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what reassurances the Scottish Government can give workers in the oil and gas industry whose jobs are at risk. 
First Minister. Well, we'll do all we can to support the workers of the oil and gas industry. Uh, they can be assured that this government is doing all that it can to help and support the industry, which is more than can be said for successive UK governments. We've repeatedly called on the UK government to listen to the recommendations of the Independent Expert Commission and to listen to the industry and bring in the stable and competitive fiscal regime that the industry needs and to bring it in now. That's what will protect jobs in the sector. Later today, the Minister for Business, Energy and Tourism will, as I've already said, make a statement to the Chamber, making clear our commitment and setting out the actions we believe the UK Government needs to take as a matter of urgency. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for her response? She will be aware that Spice has estimated that job losses could be in the order of 15,750, more than were lost with the closure of Ravenscraig, which was announced 13 years ago today. That's one in 12 jobs in the sector at risk in Scotland, and that's when the price of oil was $60 a barrel. Now that the price has fallen to below $50 a barrel, what estimate has the First Minister made of the additional jobs at risk and what will her government do to help? Minister. We will continue to uh, monitor the situation, engage with the industry as we have been doing and as we will continue to do, and we will continue to do everything within our power to help the industry through this difficult time. And we will continue to press the UK government, who hold the fiscal levers, to do what they need to do to support the industry as well. I have to say, though, I think Labour's hypocrisy on this issue, even by their standards, is quite breathtaking. Uh, I, heard, I heard earlier uh, talk of a resilience fund. And, you know, the last, time, the last time the oil price was at a level uh, similar today was in 2009. At that time, one Jim Murphy was Secretary of State for Scotland. So I had a look to see what he did back then when similar concerns about jobs were being expressed to set up a resilience fund. I couldn't find a single word that Jim Murphy had uttered back then. I did, however, find something that Jackie Bailey said quite recently when she said to set up an oil fund would simply take money away from vital public services. Now, we'll do everything. We'll do everything we can to support the industry. But let me tell you this, presiding officer, we will take no lectures from a party that during its period in office raked in £93 billion from the North Sea and didn't save a single brass farthing of it. No lectures from Labour. Murdo Fraser, briefly. Uh, thank you. Whilst the decline in the oil price is undoubtedly bad news for uh, the energy sector and for the North East economy, we should not lose sight of the fact that it is good news for many other sectors of the economy and good news for household budgets. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of the overall impact of a low oil price on the Scottish economy? Well, I think, Murdo Fraser, you, you will not often hear me say this. Uh, you may never hear me say it again, but Murdo Fraser makes a reasonable point, And we need to make sure not only are we supporting the industry with the difficulties the low oil price will present for it, but also making sure that consumers do get the benefit of that. And uh, Fergus Ewing will be writing to energy companies today to uh, press them to make sure that savings are passed on directly to consumers. I'm seeing representatives of Scottish Power myself this afternoon, and that will be a point I make. So again, that is one of the things we will continue to look at very carefully to make sure that this issue, which is of concern for the Scottish economy, nevertheless does deliver some benefits to consumers. Thank you. Question for George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister, how many families will benefit from the policy of free school meals? First Minister. Uh, well, I'm very proud to say that families of 135,000 primary one to primary three pupils from all local authorities across Scotland are set to benefit from the extension to eligibility for free school meals. And this is in addition to the families of 35,000 children in primaries one to three who are already registered for a free school meal and will save the families of every eligible child at least £330 a year. Something that I would think everybody across this chamber could welcome. Yeah. Thank you. George Adam. Thank the First Minister for her answer. The First Minister will be, I've seen reports this morning that Labour controlled Western Bartonshire Council is planning to scrap hot school dinners on Fridays. Does the First Minister agree with me that it is time for Labour to recognise what poverty campaigners are telling us, back free school meals and stop trying to undermine this important policy? Yes. yes. Minister. 
Yes, I, I do. I have to say I was uh, quite taken by what must be one of the most absurd press releases I've ever seen from Labour issue earlier this week from Ian Gray, I believe, where he said I was the person in Scotland that was going to benefit most from free school meals. It must be all these secret wains I have scattered around the country <laughs> that nobody knows about. Signing officer, I think one of the... One of the really, uh, if you're a traditional Labour supporter, one of the really depressing things to watch right now is the way Labour contorts itself to oppose anything that the SNP yes. proposes. And it has done so to such an extent that it finds itself this week in the position of being on the wrong side of poverty organisations, of trade unions, of the EIS. It finds itself actually opposing free school meals for our youngest children. It is absolutely disgraceful. So I would say to George Adam, yes, I think it's time Labour in Western Bartonshire and in every part of the country got behind free school meals, started acting like a Labour party again, for goodness sake. Aye. Duncan McNeill, briefly. Thank you. Could, it, could, it, could I ask the, the, the First Minister, in that subset of the 75,000, I believe she mentioned families, how many, how many of those could be considered as low-paid families? And how many, how many in that 75... How many in that 75,000 already receive free school meals? Uh, the 135,000 that I talked about are additional. I mean, clearly... Uh, Duncan McNeill still thinks, and possibly for all I know, still is in that alliance with the Tory party yes, that Labour okay. spent the last two years in, in the referendum campaign. I mean, surely Labour is aware, surely Labour is aware of the research and the evidence that says if you remove the stigma of means testing school lunches, then you increase uptake amongst the very children that you most want to benefit from school lunches. That used to be the kind of stuff Labour believed in, argued for, championed, advocated, but that was before the days Labour just became a subsidiary of the Scottish Tory party. Question five, Ian Gray. Ian Gray. <laughs> to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on reports that it has abandoned its policies to protect teacher numbers and reduce class sizes. First Minister. Uh, these reports are wrong. <laughs> Ian Gray. Well, if we are protecting teacher numbers and class sizes and we've lost 4,200 teachers, Frankly, if that is protecting teacher numbers, I would hate to see what not protecting them looks like. Scotland's parents and teachers are not fooled. They know we've lost teachers. They know class sizes are increasing. And the EIS is also not fooled because it is very clear, it is very clear that when Mr Swinney talked about replacing guarantees on teacher numbers with educational outcomes, he is indeed abandoning his manifesto promises on class sizes. Is that not the case, First Minister? First Minister. No, it's, it's not the case. I mean, I have made very clear in my uh, short tenure to date as First Minister that I want to make raising attainment and closing the attainment gap one of the things that we prioritise. And I hope we can all unite behind that. And let me make very clear, I don't believe that reducing teacher numbers is the best way to achieve that. But when I look at some of the, when I look at some of the statistics uh, of the record of this government's period in office, I see, for example, that the number of primary one pupils in classes of 26 or more has been cut by 97%. Uh, the pupil-teacher ratio we've been holding relatively steady and I want to make sure that we work to continue to do that. I think all of us accept that of all of the many uh, important and onerous responsibilities we have, and we've discussed some of them here already today, there is probably nothing more important than giving our young people the best start in life. That's one of the reasons why I do support free school meals. So I want to work across this chamber uh, to make sure that we are taking the action to do that and to protect the quality of education, improve the quality of education in our schools. All I would ask Ian Gray to do when it comes to teacher numbers and class sizes is not just come here and talk to me about it, but talk to some of his own councils who are some of the ones that have been responsible for cutting teacher numbers that he complains about. Liam MacArthur. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Given the resources that have been diverted into trying to meet the government's target on class sizes for P1 to 3 and teacher numbers, can the First Minister advise the Chamber what the impact has been on class sizes for pupils in primary 4 to 7? First Minister. Well, I, don't, I, mean, I don't really accept Liam MacArthur's characterisation of diverting resources to try and cut class sizes in primary one to three. I think that's a good use of resources and we made very clear we wanted to see class sizes. But, you know, Liam MacArthur makes a point. We need to make sure that we improve the quality of education, not just in primary one to three, but right through the education system, not just in primary classes, but in secondary classes as well. I accept our responsibility to take a range of actions in order to do that. And I am determined as First Minister that I will uh, lead that effort. I said to Ruth Davidson a few weeks ago to feel free to bring forward proposals for consideration to my knowledge, although I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong. Uh, Ruth Davidson hasn't yet done Well, if I've been written to, I welcome that and I will consider that carefully. I say to everybody across the chamber, Willie Rennie previously made proposals to us, which we took forward on early years education for two-year-olds. So that spirit is an open one. And if people have got proposals to make to us, then I am all uh, ready and always ready to listen. Many thanks. Question six, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the Shelter Scotland report, finding that 25% of Scots fear they cannot meet their rent or mortgage bills. First Minister. Well, these findings published by Shelter show that one in four people who are responsible for paying rent or mortgage were worried that they might not be able to do so at some point during 2015. These are genuine concerns shared by many people in Scotland, and that's why the Scottish Government has been right to prioritise affordability as a key objective of our housing policies. According to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, households in Scotland spend a smaller share of their income on housing costs than in England, but the Scottish Government is taking action to assist people who are facing financial difficulty to stay in their homes. John McAlpine. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Does the First Minister agree with me that this report underlines the importance of tackling in work poverty? And will she join me in calling for all businesses to make a New Year resolution to pay their staff a living wage? First Minister. Um, yes, I, I very much agree with that. And again, I hope all, everybody across the chamber would agree with that. We know from the statistics that in-work poverty is one of the biggest challenges we face. And one way of dealing with that is raising salary levels. That's why the government leads by example on the living wage. It's why we're funding the living wage accreditation scheme. And I encourage all businesses to look at whether uh, they can pay the living wage. And I encourage them to do so. Thank you. Finally and briefly, Ken McIntosh. Uh, does the First Minister recognise that uh, one step she might take to assuage the anxiety felt by those paying the bills uh, would be to prevent unreasonable rent rises in the private rented sector? And could the First Minister perhaps reconsider her position uh, of uh, continuing to vote with the Tories on this issue and maybe work with Labour? First Minister. I'll let... Uh gloss over that obvious lack of self-awareness on the part of, of Ken McIntosh but because he raises, he raises an important point and as he will be aware when the Housing Act 2014 was going through Parliament the Minister for Housing undertook to explore issues relating to rents in the consultation on the new private sector tenancy. Uh, respondents were asked for their views on rent levels. The consultation closed on the 28th of December and analysis of the responses is underway. So yes, this is something I would be very happy to see if we can find a way of working uh, with Labour on um, in the interests of the people that we mutually serve. Many thanks. And that concludes questions to the First Minister. And we now move to members' business. And I will allow a short pause to allow members and members of the public to leave.